My dear friends, will you just look at the title of this one? The Meat Locusts. Do I really need to say anything more? Now get your asses into gear. Sit down with your favourite drink. Because it is time to listen. Please, come get me, Hector. I don't want to be here after dark. When you hear those kinds of words from someone you've loved, even someone you're smart to keep your distance from, it's hard to stay out of their affairs. My ex-girlfriend Larissa left those words on my voicemail, calling right as dawn broke through my apartment windows. As perpetual party girls tended to call at all hours of the night, and as I had left behind my obligation to care when she left me behind, I thumbed my cell's ignore button and went back to sleep. When I roused myself a couple of hours later, I instinctively checked my phone and, much to my surprise, she'd actually left a message. She never did that. Her typical calls were either drunken rants about what I was doing wrong with our relationship or a pitiful plea to come pick her up, and she never bothered leaving messages for such things. Despite having escaped talking to her for over seven months, despite the overwhelming certainty that the message was another drunken rant, I ignored the sensible voice in my head telling me not to open this door again, and listened. Hector, it's me, Larissa said. I know I shouldn't be calling you, but you're the only person on my phone list that I can rely on. I'm at Lake Crusoe, the lake all the way at the Oregon border. 4458 Placid Lane. I know this is asking a lot, like a real lot, but I need you to come pick me up. I'll explain over the phone if you call me back, if that'll get you here, but please come get me, Hector. I don't want to be here after dark. I listened to it twice more, just to make sure I was hearing it correctly. She didn't sound drunk or angry, only scared. If this was some kind of practical joke, one designed to have your ex-boyfriend drive hours out of his way just to show how dumb he is, well, she had her act down pretty well. I knew I had to call her back, though I cringed as I did it. The call went straight to voicemail, and her mailbox was full. After two more attempts with the same response, I almost decided to ignore the message and go on with my Saturday. One-way communication was part of Larissa's playbook. I was within my rights to ignore her and move on. Instead, I checked out the address she'd supplied. There was a Lake Crusoe all right, next to a town simply named Crusoe. The address was on the northern side of the lake, about as far away from civilization as you could get in Oregon. From my apartment in Salem, it would take six hours to get there. My weekend would definitely be blown if I took her bait and went to help her. Oh, I knew I was being an idiot just considering the idea. She'd probably gone and found a party boy that was fun most of the time, but had a really bad temper when things didn't go his way, and now she needed rescue since they'd gone to the edge of nowhere in his car and he wasn't going to drive her home until he was good and ready. If it was bad enough, she could call the police. Well, I thought about doing it myself, except her message hadn't suggested a threat of real danger, so the police would be slow to get involved. I thought about calling her friends and family to see if they'd heard from her but I'd purged their numbers from my phone a month after our breakup. I doubted much would be achieved anyway. She turned it to fly by the seat of her pants and not tell anyone her plans. So, remain sensible and ignore Larissa, or take a leap of faith and go to her rescue. I listened to her message one more time. As far as I could tell, she sounded sincere. Her fear and urgency seemed real. So many mixed-up feelings bubbled up within me, from the excitement she generated when she danced to the stinging hurt when she dropped out of my life. There was still love there, I felt that for sure, because otherwise this wouldn't have been a debate. But love can be wrong, and love can be dumb, and I knew that I didn't need Larissa in my world again. Then I packed an overnight bag, got in my Honda Civic, and drove those six hours to Lake Crusoe. Because sometimes you know when someone is telling you the truth, even without the benefit of hindsight. Larissa needed help, and I was going to help her. 
consequences be damned. I called myself an idiot innumerable times on my trip there. What did I think was going to happen? Larissa would jump into my car, thank me profusely, recant all her past mistakes, and then declare her love for me. <laughs> was there any way this didn't end badly? And yet every time I thought of turning the car around, I'd follow the thought with another call to Larissa on my cell, only to get the same result. And so I kept driving, stopping only to get gas and a quick bite to eat. I just couldn't turn my back on her, not without knowing she was safe. I barely remember driving through the town of Crusoe. Such an unremarkable place it was. A smattering of homes and tourist stores for those wilderness vacationers heading to the lake. Oh, my mind was too preoccupied to pay much attention. RVs and pickups filled the parking lots, their owners buying provisions for their weekend stay in the wilderness. People acted as people do preparing for a good time, blissfully unaware of anything untoward happening in their vicinity. Well, either the joke was on me or on them. In about half an hour, I'd find out. I then reached the edge of the forest surrounding Lake Crusoe, and I immediately felt my anxiety rise. The day had been clear and bright, the sun slated to disappear a few hours hence, but as I drove into the forest, I was quickly cast into shadow, the trees gobbling up the light, giving the afternoon an early twilight feeling. The road wound around the tree-covered hillside, slowing my pace. A steady supply of evergreen branches and foliage blocked the world from my sight. I expected to encounter some kind of wildlife attempting a road crossing as I drove along, but the wildlife kept its distance that day. Instead, I periodically spotted these odd discolorations dotting the local evergreens, fuzzy grey protuberances that seemed to resemble part of a tree if you stared directly at them, but appeared more blurry and indistinct in my peripheral vision. I saw one or two of these odd anomalies every few miles, and they were quite perplexing. Perhaps some kind of arboreal disease, a new kind of invasive moss or insect, was making its way through the forest. I began to count them as I went, a way to distract me from my more pressing anxieties. Just before the turn-off to Placid Lane, I noticed one lone pine towering above most of its brethren. Its height wasn't what drew my attention, though. The upper length of its trunk was absolutely infested with the fuzzy lumps I'd been counting. There had to have been several dozen dotting the tree. As I drove by, I had this very disconcerting feeling that there was a shape behind the blurriness I was seeing. It was like staring at a picture that looked like a vase one moment, then two faces staring at each other the second. Only I couldn't recognize either shape, couldn't put a coherent idea to either image. I just knew that there was something else under all that indistinctness. Well, it's easy for humans to dismiss their misgivings. We see warning signs and think they're either lies or they only apply to other people. Heaven knows I did that plenty of times with Larissa in the past, and I was well on my way to possibly repeating history. By the time I turned onto the dirt road that was Placid Lane and put the big tree in my rear-view mirror, I largely dismissed the phenomenon. I'd seen only a bunch of weird moss, after all, and I clearly had reasons to be anxious. Larissa's vacation spot was just ahead, and I was about to find out how much of an idiot I truly was. The vacation spot turned out to be a summer home instead of a cabin, a nice two-story house built on the hillside, ringed by a cluster of trees that hid most of the structure from roadside view. From what snippets I could make out, it became clear that Larissa's boyfriend was probably rolling in dough and I was about to get on the bad side of someone with a personal lawyer at his beck and call. But that thought quickly died, replaced by utter confusion. I stopped my car right before the driveway leading into the house because I had no way to get my Civic around the black SUV that blocked it. The vehicle had ploughed into a thick pine bordering the driveway, one of its front tyres snarled up on either a massive root or rock formation. Both doors on the driver's side were open. The front windshield was cracked. An obvious accident, but, but I couldn't tell how long ago it had occurred. I turned off my car and exited, 
moving up to the SUV and searching it briefly. There was no one left inside. It didn't take a forensic scientist to deduce that the occupants of the SUV had left in a hurry, not bothering to even shut the doors. I almost called out to Larissa, to tell her or whoever was around that I was here. Yet I didn't. I felt the need to keep my mouth shut. I could understand a car accident, such things happened all the time, but why wasn't there a tow truck out here by now? Why wasn't someone staying with the SUV? What if there was another threat out here? Something that had forced the vehicle's occupants to flee? I'll get out my cell phone, holding it in my left hand, and walk past the SUV. I still needed more to go on before I called the cops. When it came to Larissa, this kind of incident wasn't unexpected. She'd wrecked a car or two in her time without bothering to call it in. I told myself that all I was going to do was make sure she was okay, call the proper authorities when I knew what was what, and then leave. If Larissa was in trouble and needed to leave with me, I could do that. But if she was responsible for this mess, I wasn't going to clean it up for her. Yet with each step I took toward the house, my unease grew more pronounced. The driveway ended at a closed garage with no other vehicles present. The front yard had a well-manicured lawn and a quartet of rose bushes adorned with small pink roses. As I approached the front door, I saw that one of the bushes was splashed with crimson liquid, its pink petals spattered with darker red dots. Rounding the bush, I recoiled in disgust as I found the source of the blood. The body it had come from was laid out before the open door. The rancid smell of the victim hit me, and to my credit I didn't vomit my hamburger lunch up despite a sudden desire to do so. I averted my gaze to avoid full-blown freak-out time because the body was in at least three separate pieces, surrounded by a pool of drying blood. It wasn't Larissa. Too big and uh, too male. He was dressed in casual wear, his clothes as torn up as the rest of him. Her boyfriend, I wagered, but the condition of his face made easy identification impossible. Someone or something had savaged it into a torn, pulpy mess. It took me a few seconds to remember my phone and a few more seconds of frantic finger action to realize I had no reception. I expressed my unhappiness with a storm of swear words that I won't repeat in polite company. It was when I heard my voice cursing out into the solitude that honest fear finally took hold of me, because by all appearances I was alone with a victim of either a savage wildlife attack or a local axe murderer. I quickly quieted, and in the dread silence, I could hear my inner voice of sensibility talking. Get back into the car, it said. Drive away and call for help. Well, I almost listened to it, but that persistent voice of chivalry was also talking, and its voice was louder. This was where Larissa was supposed to be. If she was still alive and I drove away, I'd be abandoning her to her fate. Then again, if the killer was still around... I'd just be adding to the body count. It was a pointless debate. I couldn't turn my back on Larissa, especially now. Well, judge me harshly for that if you must. Call me stupid and I'll agree. But instead of running back to my car, I gritted my teeth and walked up to the stone path to the waiting body, taking care not to tread on the copious amount of blood drying on the rocks. I honestly don't know how crime scene workers do it. Between the mobs of insects already going to work on the body, the terrified expression on what remained of his face, and the nauseating aroma of various bodily fluids, I could barely stand to look at it. There were definite chunks of flesh missing from all over his torso, lending evidence to my wildlife attack hypothesis. I also noticed a cell phone in his right hand, lacking power but still intact. An animal would have ignored a phone, but... A human assailant would have taken it or destroyed it. I wasn't about to touch the corpse, so I was done here. The front door was ajar and I could see the hallway past it, but no signs of activity within. 
Still, there was a lot of house to cover, and if I was serious about helping Larissa, I had to go inside. Stealing myself for another bout of brave idiocy, I closed my eyes, counted to five, and... Freeze. I may have avoided up chucking from disgust, but I'm forced to admit I did pee myself a little when I heard that harsh word come from behind. At least I didn't have much in me at the time. Lock your hands behind your head and turn around slowly, insisted the voice, a feminine one with a tone that promised instant violence for disobedience. I did as she ordered, really hoping this person didn't have an itchy trigger finger. The woman standing before me had a rifle trained at my head, and while I'm pretty illiterate when it comes to guns, I could tell that it was military grade and not a hunting weapon. She was a foot shorter than me, had a frame of solid muscle, a short crop of white hair, and a cluster of scars on her face that reminded me of the kind of scratches my old cat would occasionally give me. She was dressed head to toe in hunter garb, but instead of jungle camouflage, the colors were dark blue. Even the headband she wore was a solid navy blue. She had a disciplined air about her, and I believe this woman would kill me without hesitation if I gave her a reason. Fearing that she'd peg me as a murderer, I glanced down at the mangled corpse and said, I didn't kill him. I was... I know that, genius, she interrupted. Tell me who you are and why you're here. Um, my name's Hector, I quickly replied. I have a friend staying here who called me this morning to come get her. Do you have any weapons on you? I shook my head, and while I sensed she wasn't ready to take my word for it, she lowered her weapon and motioned with it for me to come away from the house. Then she pointed to a spot on the driveway and told me to stay right there with my hands where she could see them. I complied. She backed off a few feet to an azure-colored backpack lying on the ground. I hadn't noticed the pack until now, and while she rummaged through its front pockets, she kept her eyes and rifle aimed at my direction. Look, I don't have the authority to frisk you or detain you, Hector, she explained, so I'm going to have to trust you. That said, you can trust me when I say that the moment you pull anything will be your last moment on this earth. Understand? I nodded. She'd retrieved two small objects that resembled glass tennis balls. She pocketed one, held the other, walked down the driveway several meters, tinkered with the glass ball for a moment, and finally placed it on the ground. The ball began to pulse a quick burst of cerulean light every few seconds, like a beacon designed to warn airplanes of tall structures in the dark. That'll cover our back for a while, the woman stated, walking past me and toward the corpse. You can put your hands down now. You seem harmless. She stopped at the body, kneeling down and inspecting it with the same detachment and morgue work on my display. Well, I let her do a thing in silence, not at all sure what was going on or who this person was. Was this your friend? She asked absently, her fingers measuring the width of a particularly large gouge in the body's left thigh. No, um, I think she might be in the house. I was about to go in when you showed. Yeah, I saw that. Why do you think I stopped you? I... My confusion and fear slid toward irritation. Larissa was still missing and this mystery woman wasn't being very forthcoming. Okay, I think it's time you told me who you are. Madison, she replied flatly. I've been watching the house for a good hour before you got here. The MLs can linger around their killers for up to four hours, and it's never a good idea to interrupt them. You're lucky they moved on. The, um, MLs? Madison ignored my question, choosing instead to walk around the corpse and pry out the cell phone from the body's death grip. She looked it over closely, grimaced, and then placed it on the ground next to the body. She turned her head to me. The ones who did this... Well, the main pack has moved on, but sometimes one of the dumber ones gets left behind. Stuck in a closet or a bathroom. Just one of those things can ruin your whole day. I looked at the corpse again and shuddered at the sheer viciousness of the attack. Uh, 
Are they animals? Well, in a fashion and under different circumstances, I love to answer the hunt questions you must have, but we are not secure. You need to leave this area. I took a deep breath, treading what I had to say next, but knowing that I couldn't leave here without being sure. My friend might still be in the house. I need to go in there. Madison gave me a small, sympathetic smile. I know all about not wanting to leave friends behind, Hector. But the odds are excellent that there's no one alive in there. You should get back to your car and go. I'll handle it from here. I shook my head adamantly. You don't know she's dead. She might be hiding in the house. And she might not even be in there. I just... I need to know. Madison groaned. Ah, she is it. You two more than friends at some point. Not your business. Look, I'll stay out here and out of the way if you want, but... She held up a hand to silence me. Fine, I don't have the authority to stop you being stupid. But if you're staying, you should come with me. I looked at her with confusion. Why? Because the safest place for you is right next to me. She said this without any boasting, and I had no trouble believing her. She fished out the second glass ball from her gear and handed it to me. It was heavier than I expected, and I could see the tiny machinery residing inside it. She pointed to a triangular button on the beacon surface and said, That activates it. If you see anything move that isn't me... You push that button. The pulse light disorients them, but it doesn't stop them. Otherwise, stay behind me and follow every instruction I give. And I really hope you're not one of those types that likes to wander off in times of crisis. Because I shoot guys like that. Madison led the way past the front door, rifle at the ready and I followed close behind, gripping the ball as if my life depended on it. Right away I noticed the mob of grimy tracks on the wood flooring, so many that a mental picture of a pack of muddy dogs running wild in the house popped into my mind. I picked out an individual print, thin, three-toed and almost skeletal. Numerous scratches and gouges accompanied the tracks, sometimes dotting the walls and even the ceiling in places. A new pungent odour assailed my nostrils, something close to urine but far more sour than what I was used to. And all those hundred questions in my mind about these MLs kept on pestering me, demanding answers. But I dare not break the silence and distract Madison. Her outward calm helped to dissipate my fear, but I couldn't help but feel like I was way out of my depth, with a total stranger throwing me a life preserver that she could yank away at any moment. The short hallway led to the living room, the once lavish spread of furniture having been reduced to garbage. Cushions and pillows shredded, wooden frames smashed and cracked, art and pictures reduced to shards. Well, the damage seemed as deliberate as it was malicious. Madison moved through the damage with cool precision, sweeping every corner and every potential hiding spot. I kept to the centre of the room and out of her way watching for any unexpected movement around the house. I'd hoped that our search would be an ultimately fruitless one, because that would mean that Larissa wasn't here, that she might have escaped. It was a small hope, but better than no hope at all. For all my mixed-up feelings toward Larissa, I like to think I saw her nature pretty clearly. She was not a survivor type. If she'd been in this house when the animals had come, she would not have known what to do. Then I noticed that one of the hallways leading from the living room showed a large smear of red, followed by a thinner trail leading to a closed door. My heart sinking, I pointed it out to Madison. She told me to wait while she checked it out. She moved to the door and cautiously opened it. She hesitated for a brief second, then went inside and out of sight. I stood there, scanning the room, on guard for anything afraid of what Madison would find, afraid that she might not come back out at all. 
I think only a minute had gone by before Madison reappeared, but it felt like an hour. She had a woman's purse in her left hand, her rifle in her right. Her demeanour had changed to that of a doctor about to tell a patient that they only had a year to live. Is this hers? She held up the purse, a lavender model dotted with smears of blood and several deep rips in the material. I don't recognise it, I said, a hopeful note in my voice. Look through it and make sure, Madison said, handing me the purse. Stay here for now. The downstairs is secure, but I need to check the second floor. Do yourself a favour and don't go into the bedroom. What did you find? I asked. But she ignored me as she moved to the second floor stairs, and I had a feeling that it was a question I already knew the answer to. I held off looking in the purse, holding out hope that Larissa didn't have a purse like this. I knew she could have bought one, but that wasn't a reality I wanted to accept. In that moment, she wasn't gone. In that moment, I could still pretend that I could be the gallant knight coming to her rescue for just a few seconds longer. And then my right hand slipped into the purse, and I pulled out her makeup kit, the round one that she could whip out in the blink of an eye. I pulled out her phone, the same model that she called me with dozens of times before. I pulled out her wallet, and her driving license displayed her brown-haired, blue-eyed face for all to see. I didn't notice when Madison returned. I think shock was dulling my senses at the time. But when I did look up to acknowledge her, she gave me a grim nod and refrained from asking the obvious. She gestured with her head in the direction of the front door. We should go, she said. The upper floor is clear. No other victims, thankfully. I... I stammered a couple of times, still trying to process my horror, but I finally got out my grim statement. I think I should go see for myself. Madison closed her eyes and sighed before speaking again. I know you won't close your pal, and you do what you need to do, but... Trust me, there's no closure through that door. Only nightmares. She held out her hand, her intention to take Larissa's purse. I gave it to her without complaint. Then she quietly stayed with me until I was ready to leave. Well, I don't know if it was cowardice or pragmatism that kept me from going into the bedroom, but I never went in. All things considered, I don't regret my decision. I had expected Madison to take me over to my car and all but insist that I get the hell out of Dodge. And, well, if she'd done so, I'd have agreed. I didn't want to be here anymore. Amongst my myriad emotions was a profound sense of failure. If I'd called the police instead of rushing in myself, maybe things would have turned out differently. Maybe Larissa would be alive. I wanted to be alone with my sadness, but Madison didn't agree. She told me to stay put and keep my glass beacon close at hand while she took care of a few things. So I found myself leaning against the side of the house, trapped between my grief for my ex-girlfriend and my growing desire to get answers about her death. By the time I finally felt sane enough to start thinking in the moment again, Madison had covered the body on the stone path with a blanket from inside, closed the front door to the house, now appeared to be working with an iPad she'd pulled from her pack. She also asked me a few questions, mostly about Larissa and the phone call she'd made to me this morning. Of course, she still refused to answer my own questions, telling me she'd get around to explanations later. Not only that, but she was making no move to call the police or anyone else, despite the double homicide before us. Madison's clinical approach to everything began to rub me wrong and I pulled out my phone to make the call myself. As before, there was no signal. Still, my patience with Madison was rapidly running out, and when my frustration finally overpowered my fear, I walked up to her and tapped her on the back. I think I'm overdue an explanation, Madison, I said. I then noticed that the iPad in her hands displayed a topographical map, and that Madison had been tracing red lines and red X's onto its surface with her finger. So enthralled she was in the activity that she didn't even notice me until I'd touched her. She even jumped slightly before giving me an annoyed glare. 
I'm trying to save lives, she replied, lowering her iPad. This isn't the time. Doesn't seem like there'll ever be a time. I shook my head and started walking down the driveway towards my car. I'm leaving. Say hi to the police when they get here. If you leave right now, you will be dead before you get to the highway. I stopped in my tracks and turned back to Madison. Neither her tone nor her posture indicated a threat, but I could tell from her face that she meant what she'd said. Still, I was done with the mystery game. I'll take my chances, unless you give me a reason to believe you, I said. I don't think she was used to being challenged, as I saw a brief scowl cross her face before she spoke to me. Have you seen anything unusual today? I furrowed my brow at the question. Are you serious? She grunted in exasperation over a phrasing error. I meant on your way up here. In particular, have you seen strange growths on the trees? Like fuzzy images that might offend the eye? Anything like that? I took a moment to recollect my trip, and then told her what I'd seen. Especially the one tree right before Placid Lane that looked infested with some kind of weird moss. Upon hearing that, Madison swore, looking genuinely unnerved now. What you were seeing was the type of camouflage they use, she explained. They can resemble parts of the forest, like tree bark or bramble, but they don't do a good job of it. If you look at them when they're masked for too long, you can tell something's off with their cover. One or two of them, a handful, can mask themselves pretty well. Enough for most people to ignore. But if you saw dozens of them, then they weren't trying to hide. That means they're on the hunt. Next to Madison's backpack was Larissa's purse. She went over to it and pulled out Larissa's phone, holding it up for me to see clearly. This phone is completely intact. They learn, you see. They adapt like we do. Well, they learned a few years back that cell phones were something to be smashed to keep their prey from calling for help. But they didn't destroy this one or the other victim's phone. And they let you come here without any problems. I shrugged away the concern. Well, I was in a car. Oh, they've taken down people in cars. You did notice the wreck in the driveway, right? Like I said, they're adaptable. They know how to induce accidents. And what you've told me about your friend, I think they've been casing this place for at least a day. I think your friend caught wind of them last night, which is why she called you this morning. Probably because her new boyfriend either dismissed her fears or thought he could handle things. Yeah, we get a lot of the fake rugged types. The business players who buy summer homes and then vacation up here thinking the stock market and the wilderness work by the same rules. And your friend Hatch have been pretty scared, because cell phone coverage here is pretty bad, and there's only one reliable spot. Madison pointed up the hill, to an unseen location through the thick foliage. Cell point, they call it. Probably hide there alone to make the call. I suspect that's why the pack went after her and her boy toy this morning. Walking in these woods alone when an ML pack is around... It's like tying some raw steaks to yourself and trying to dance around a tiger pit. Well, at least you did something, I replied, feeling a need to defend my dead friend. Yeah, that she did, Madison frowned as she said the words. That's what worries me, Hector. They could have taken her in the woods at any time. She would have disappeared and you'd never have known her fate. But they were thinking ahead to their next meal. They waited until... After she made a call and then trailed her way back here. Then they decided to, you know, play with their food a bit. Ah, they do that sometimes, letting the victim think they're getting away when they're really just prolonging the suffering. Your friend was allowed to get into the SUV, only to have an accident. And after that, they chased down the male victim here on the steps. And your friend in the bedroom. I closed my eyes at the mention of Larissa's gruesome fate. Even though I didn't see it, my imagination coughed up the image of Larissa screaming in terror as a group of beasts ran after her, the dying screams of her new boyfriend filling the air behind her, and then getting cornered in the bedroom before... Here's the thing, Hector, 
continued Madison, a word snapping me out of my horrible daydream. I was grateful for that. With both victims, they waited. They gave them a chance to go for their phones. Now, usually they're content just to eat their prey and move on, but not this time. No. They want people to come. They want the police. They want the paramedics. Oh, this pack is big and it's hungry. She was growing more apprehensive as she talked, and it did nothing for my calm either. These don't sound like dumb animals, I said. They're not like the rest of the woodland critters, you know, she replied. And if you leave, they'll get to you before you drive a mile down that road. And that's when we heard the cries. Not human cries. Not the cry of any creature I was familiar with type of rasping cough combined with a high-pitched warble that went on for several seconds. When it cut off, the silence that followed scared me more. I couldn't tell the distance or the direction, but Madison must have pinned it down as she faced south, down the road I'd traveled to get here. She handed me her iPad, got her rifle, and held it at the ready. I started to ask if it was one of the MLs, when she held up an insistent hand, quieting me. In short order, two more calls sounded out, very similar to the previous one, and then more and more, until it was a veritable concert of creatures. I thought of a mutant wolf pack announcing itself to the world, and it occurred to me that sundown couldn't be far off. Well, facing these murderous beasts during the day was bad enough but the idea of dealing with them at night chilled me to the bone. With practice ease, Madison moved to her backpack and donned it, all the while keeping her attention on the howling pack in the distance. She then waved at me to follow her, and we moved silently toward the main road. By the time we got to my car, the pack had quieted, the silence suggesting more menace than the howls ever could. Madison had a stop next to my car, and she pointed at my trunk. Did you bring luggage that you can carry? I can manage it, I replied. But why aren't we taking my car? Nope, walking is better. Now hurry up and get your bag. I didn't budge. This long day kept getting longer, and I wasn't about to abandon my vehicle just on Madison's say-so. Those things sound close. How does walking back to town make any sense? I could see the apprehension on Madison's face, and she now had her rifle trained on the road back to civilization. We're not going back to town. We won't make it if we try. What? My voice elevated as my emotional restraint began to give way. I'm not about to... Quiet. Her hushed demand carried the weight of a soldier who knew when her situation was getting deadly. I knew not to push her further, yet I still didn't move to get my back. I don't know you, Hector, she said in a low voice, never taking her eyes from the road ahead of us. You don't know me either. I have no authority to make you do anything. You want to drive away? Do so. You want to walk your own path? Feel free. The moment you leave my sight, you are on your own. I won't come to save you because I have obligations beyond you. So you need to make up your mind here and now if you can trust me without getting angry every time something I do doesn't jive with your sensibilities. If you're coming with me, get your back. Because in 30 seconds I'm leaving no matter what. What else could I do? I didn't want to suffer the same fate as Larissa, and Madison remained my one lifeline. So, like the good little soldier I was, I grabbed my overnight bag stashed Madison's iPad in it and awaited her command. She nodded approvingly at my decision. Right, we're going to continue down this road. You're walking ahead of me. Just follow it until I told you not to. Don't distract me and don't engage in small talk. The flashball I play should have ten more minutes of juice left, which will give us a ten minute head start. Let's not waste any more of it. And so we walked, heading away from the monsters that had devoured my friend, and further away from the world that I once knew. I had the terrible feeling that it was a world I was never going to see again. 
the day darkened considerably as we moved, loose dirt puffing up under my shoes and shadows lengthening through the breaks in the tree boughs. The forest seemed very still, devoid of bird calls or skittering rodents or even buzzing insects. I watched every tree we passed for weird growths or blurry spots, and the sweat I felt beating on my forehead had little to do with exertion. Madison had us moving at a brisk pace, but she held us back from rushing too fast. Despite my desire to put as much distance between us and the things that had killed Larissa, I had a feeling that speed wasn't going to help us in this situation. Humans had learned to rely on our intellect and technology. We were otherwise sorely outmatched in the wilderness. The next hour passed in silence, dread stealing away my need for answers on what these MLs were. But as we journeyed further, the silence grew heavy on my mind. I felt like I'd been torn away from the real world and had been plopped into some bad campfire story where serial killers with hook hands and ghosts out to find their golden arms abided. Well, Madison might have the training to keep quiet for long periods of time, but I knew I'd crack up if we kept going like this much longer. Can I ask questions if it isn't small talk? I dared to ask. Madison didn't respond at first, undoubtedly deciding if the situation was safe enough for conversation. I looked back at her and she shrugged. Just keep your voice low, your words to the point, and your eyes front. Well, I could live with these conditions, so I asked away. Didn't you tell me that these MLs had moved on? Uh, from the house, but they're still in the area. They don't usually come back to their kills once they've fed, but they're changing their tactics. So, what are they? What is an ML? Madison gave a rueful laugh at the question. I could write a book about them, Hector, but I'll just give you the Cliff Notes version. ML stands for Meat Locus. I was sorry I'd asked. I previously pictured the MLs as some kind of canine type beast. Now I had mental images of giant grasshoppers swarming over people and stripping off their flesh. It's not really an accurate name, continued Madison. They operate like wolves more than insect swarms. But among us Wranglers, the name stuck. Wranglers? Yours truly. On the books, I'm a park ranger. There are only a few of us, all sworn to secrecy and living quiet lives away from the public. Oh, you should be honored. Meeting one of us is like meeting the Tooth Fairy. I didn't feel especially honored, but, but I wasn't crass enough to say so. Is this one of those situations where the government keeps them a secret to avoid panic? A cry from the trees to my right ended our conversation. I froze as the horrid call of the meat locust sounded out, this one much closer than the ones I'd heard at the house. I turned to Madison for guidance, but her response was to back away from me, holding her rifle at the ready as she walked off the road and towards a small manzanita bush. Do not move, do not speak, and do not fight them, she ordered before she disappeared entirely. I could only splutter at her sudden act of abandonment, wanting to lodge my protest but scared to speak with the beast so close. Her actions made no sense. I could see part of her blue outfit through the shrubbery, and if I could see then surely the beast could as well. Then another round of howls rang out, and I suddenly felt very exposed, standing in the middle of the road like a deer awaiting a fatal rendezvous with a semi-truck. I heard something moving rapidly through the brush and duff, several somethings in fact, smashing twigs and grunting with effort on their way up the hill. They were approaching like hounds on a rabbit hunt, coming directly my way. Then they found me, and my fanciful imaginings on their appearance proved quite inadequate for the monster's true form. At first I could only see indistinct humanoid shapes, grey blurs that loped like animals on all fours, moving through the forest with alarming speed. As they closed in, the blurriness covering them faded away and revealed the horrid creature underneath. Thin as skeletons, their grey skin had a reptilian texture, like that of a python. 
Their hands and feet contained only three digits each, a long curved claw attached to each digit. I thought those massive claws would get in their way when they ran, but they moved with amazing grace and swiftness. I spotted four creatures approaching, and in short order they reached the road with only forty feet between us. They skidded to a halt. Eight pairs of jet black eyes locked on me, swimming with dark purpose. My heart went into overdrive as I stared back, my limbs screaming at me to do something, anything. I could see them better now, with their broad faces, slits for noses and wide mouths. Their bald heads carried no hair, nor could I see any ears or even holes where ears should be. Their lipless mouths opened and closed as if tasting the air, revealing two rows of needle-like teeth. How small they were, barely coming up to my waist. How thin as well, certainly too thin to have much striking power. But their black eyes showed the truth of their nature. They were killers, happy little murder machines. What stood out to me the most at that despairing moment was how identical they seemed. Their height, their build, their movements and faces. They all seemed so similar. Even their voices were the same. And they screamed at me with clear, malicious need. And I found I couldn't discern one scream from the other. They charged, all four sprinting straight at me. At that moment, all I could do was stand and scream in abject terror unable to think or react, expecting claws and teeth to find me before I could even take a step. And then, a gunshot ran out, and the rightmost ML dropped, a puff of grey dust jetting from its head as it fell lifeless to the dirt. The other three skidded to a halt, only to have a second one go down as Madison nailed it. I saw confusion in their movements, as if they couldn't quite understand what was going on and Madison used that pause to kill ML number three. The last one finally zeroed in on Madison, screaming its version of bloody murder, and charged her instead of me. It got ten feet before a bullet tore its left arm away completely, the creature tumbling as it hit the ground. Then it was sprawled out on the road, as lifeless as the others. It took me a long moment to recover from my terror, to be aware of the world again, to even realize that I wasn't dead. That was the first time I'd ever felt like a Thanksgiving turkey, and if Madison hadn't taken them out, it would have been my last. I stood there as she came from behind the manzanita, and walked about the corpses, inspecting them with the same clinical detachment she'd exhibited with the body of Larissa's dead boyfriend. Did... did you just use me as bait? I asked once I'd found my voice again. She finished nudging the corpse at her feet with a boot, then looked at me and shrugged. It was the only way I could save your life. She gestured to her clothes. Oh, they have a hard time processing the color blue. To them it works like camouflage. Also, their vision is partly motion-based, so fast-moving things attract their attention. That's why cars are a bad idea when dealing with MLs. Didn't have the time to explain all this to you, so, yeah, you were bait. I glared at her rather fiercely. Don't you think this information might have been important to share earlier? She shook her head. You're not a hunter or a soldier, Hector. Telling you all this would have only given you enough confidence to get yourself killed. It's hard to stay angry with someone who's just saved your life, but I still didn't like being kept in the dark. Look, you know these things are coming after us, I angrily declared, pointing at a nearby corpse. But instead of staying at the house and standing our ground there, you dragged me out here. Going on foot was the only chance we had, Hector, she calmly replied. You still don't know what we're up against here. If you'll take a deep breath and chill for a moment, I'll educate you. We're safe for the time being. She motioned at me to come toward the bodies. Well, I still wanted to be angry, but I wanted answers more. I approached hesitantly, more than a little unnerved to get any closer to these creatures, even the dead ones. 
The body at Madison's feet had a bullet hole right through its forehead, but no blood leaked from it. Instead, the body appeared to be gathering dust at an absurd rate, a grey cloud slowly thickening around it. At the same time, the body seemed to be shrinking, growing thinner with each passing moment. You see this? She said. This is one of the reasons why no one knows about these creatures. In less than ten minutes, these corpses will be dust in the wind. Tell me, Hector. Do you know of any animals that decompose so quickly? I believed her. Already the corpse's right hand had crumbled into nothingness, and its left hand was about to follow. There was also not a drop of fluid to be found, as if their veins had been filled with dust and dirt. I didn't think I could get more unnerved, but I managed it. These things were not of the natural order. Have you tried capturing one alive? I asked. Yep, yeah, and it never works. They're immune to tranquilizers, and they always find a way to either escape or kill themselves. And to answer your next question, there's already video evidence of them, but people just mistake them for other cryptid legends like chupacabras and Jersey Devils. Or well, they just called it doctored or fake footage. She looked off towards the woods, as if searching for more MLs, or perhaps just lost in thought. I kept staring at the body before me, watching as bit by bit it disintegrated. I wanted to believe they were just animals, some kind of aberration or mutant that had got unnoticed all this time. One more small comfort yanked away from me. When I looked at the fourth corpse, I noticed that it wasn't decomposing as fast as the others. Curious, I walked over to it and saw that outside of its missing arm, it looked fairly intact. It was face down with no cloud of grey hovering over it, and I wondered if this was a rare instance of a non-decomposing ML. I glanced back at Madison, who still had her back turned, and I almost told her about the corpse when I heard a slight rustle in front of me. In a split second, it hit me that the reason why the corpse wasn't dissolving was that it wasn't a corpse at all. It was all I could do to fall back from the thing as it rose up on three limbs and lunged at me, black eyes wide, mouth curled in searing rage. But it proceeded to leap over me instead of onto me, and as my butt hit the dirt, I heard Madison swear in alarm, followed by a gunshot. By the time I could twist my body to look around, the creature was sprinting into the woods like a cat on fire, Madison firing once more and putting a new hole in a pine before the brush gave it cover. Madison swore again, then came over to me and helped me up. Oh, you're damn lucky I was trying to escape, she said. But that's not on you. I should have checked the body. Can you walk? I nodded, then she abruptly walked away from me. Not up the road, mind you, nothing sensible like that, but into the woods in roughly the same direction as the ML. She motioned at me to come, and when I asked her rather emphatically why, she told me that she had to track the ML and that I was free to stay right here and take my chances otherwise. As I followed after her, I considered whether my odds of survival were getting higher or lower the longer I stayed with Madison. Going toward the monsters did not seem like a smart move, but lacking other wilderness saviors, I kept up with her as best I could, dreading what new horror I would find at the end of this path. Well, there was no way to keep up with the creature so Madison relied on her tracking skills to follow it, stopping periodically to inspect a print in the earth or a broken twig. I marveled at her hunting skills while at the same time questioning the logic behind it. The sun was heading for the horizon now, with maybe two hours of sunlight left. I hadn't packed a light in my bag, and I absolutely knew that being out here in the dark would be the end of me. At first it was all uphill, slow going through scratching bramble and up steep inclines. My lack of fitness finally caught up with me, and I struggled to keep behind Madison, sweat caking my clothes and my legs beginning to throb. We crested the hill and headed downward again, finding the start of a dry creek bed close to the bottom. 
Madison decided to break into a jog as she followed the dry creek, all but ignoring my protest to slow down. A great urgency had overcome her, and at the point where the dry creek became wet, I had to stop and rest for a moment. Madison kept going, practically sprinting now. Well, I had no idea why Madison had all but abandoned me until my breathing slowed and I could hear distant cries, ugly sounds similar to the hunting calls of the creatures, but tinged with something akin to pain or alarm. There were many of them, and I did not want to get any closer. But my survival was chained to Madison, so I forced myself to follow. I chased Madison's trail along the creek, and it didn't take long before the creek cleared the trees and entered a small clearing, stunted grasses and rotting logs littering the area. Madison was already at the center of the clearing, but I stopped only a few feet in. I could see the horrid gathering just fine from here, and I had no desire to get closer. Well, there had to be a dozen MLs in the clearing, almost all of them lying on their sides in the dirt, writhing and spasming as if they were having a collective seizure. Only one bucked this pattern, the three-limb creature we'd been tracking. It stood on a log, acting as a sentinel for its brethren, and when it saw Madison, it emitted a yell that came across as a warning to the others. But the other MLs didn't respond to it, nor did they respond to the gunshot from Madison's rifle that plugged the three-limbed beast in the head and sent it tumbling off its perch. My initial thought upon seeing the pack writhing on the ground was that they were sick from some disease, maybe from something, well, someone they'd eaten. If that was the case, Madison's attitude suggested it wasn't going to last long. She rushed through the clearing with renewed urgency, nearly tripping over a tree stump in her desperation. Stay where you are, no matter what you see, she called back to me, and as she reached the first meat locust and put a bullet through its skull, I began to understand, with renewed horror, what was happening. I focused on one of the MLs in the middle of the clearing, and I could see it had a kind of tumour or growth on its back, and it was growing rapidly. As I watched, the growth began to spread out, forming stick-like protuberances that widened and grew definition, like an invisible artist turning a lump of clay into a figurine. The protuberances sharpened into limbs, the ends forming into hands and feet. A neck emerged, then an oval-shaped head, and then the head shifted into recognizable features like eyes and a mouth. Spasmodic bursts of motion came from the growth as the new body, the new ML, grew to match its parents' size and width. They were all doing this. This was reproduction, akin to cellular cloning, but at a grotesquely fast rate. And then it stopped, just as grotesquely fast, when Madison reached it and killed its parent, the unfinished creature as stone dead as the parent it was tethered to. Five more MLs and their spawn lay motionless behind Madison and she quickly went to work on the remaining five. She didn't make it to the last one before the budding process finished, the infant ML severing from its parent with a sickening tearing sound. Both parent and child reacted to Madison's arrival by weakly standing and confronting her, but two final shots from her rifle put them back on the ground. A grey haze slowly enveloped the clearing as the bodies decomposed. Madison double-checking each kill to avoid another playing possum moment. I found a moss-covered log to sit on while she finished her gruesome business, my legs shaky and my mind whirling. I closed my eyes and held my head in my hands, breathing regularly and deliberately to control the anxiety building inside me. I had to wonder if this was what soldiers felt after their first battle, when the civil normal life you were used to gets forever ripped away by violence and insanity. At that moment, I just wanted the world to fade away and leave me alone, let me process my experience in my own time. I wanted to mourn my ex-girlfriend and go back to my boring yet predictable job, pretending that today was only a sordid nightmare from which I eventually woke up. 
I heard Madison's boots crunch through twigs and grass as she came to my spot and quickly sat down on my log. She seemed to understand my reaction and gave me a few minutes before she tapped on my shoulder to get my attention. This is why we had to leave Hector, she said. This is why we call them locusts. They feed and they reproduce. And they're real good at both. If we'd stayed put, we'd have been cornered at that house and overwhelmed. She stood up and motioned me to follow. You good to get moving? She asked. I lied and nodded to her. I wanted to root myself to that log because every move I made today had led to somewhere worse. But I forced myself off the log and followed her away from the clearing. It was a hike we made in silence. And this time, I was glad for the quiet. We weren't going back to the road... I could tell that much. Madison had us take a parallel course through the woods, using a narrow deer trail through a great deal of brush and tall grass. This time I followed at her heels, watching the woods vigilantly, locking onto the slightest rustling leaf or cracking twig. I felt an odd combination of numbness and fear, surrendering myself to Madison's leadership without any further desire to resist, but deathly afraid of each step I took through the forest. I kept my mouth buttoned up, fearful of making noise and even more afraid to add more disquieting truths to my life. Madison seemed far more at ease, keeping a constant eye on our surroundings but with an air of confidence that, while failing to soothe me, was good for keeping me from bolting in sheer terror. The sun was about to set, taking with it the last bits of light from our pile of the world. Madison must have sensed my growing apprehension, for the one time she spoke was in reassurance that we were close to her sanctuary. Keep my eyes forward, my legs moving, and I'll be okay. I don't remember how long that leg of our journey lasted, only a couple of hours at most, but by the time I laid eyes on Madison's sanctuary, I felt like I'd been walking for days without end. Her home turned out to be an unassuming log cabin, nestled between a cluster of tall pines and connected to civilization through a dirt path that led toward the main road. It reminded me of a groundskeeper lodge from a larger resort, a place where one stays while you are on the job. I noticed that some of the trees had lanterns affixed to their trunks, a fuel hose running from each lantern back to the house. Madison told me to go on in while she prepared for the night throwing me her cabin key. I unlocked the sturdy oak door and went in, noticing the two large sliding steel latches on the door's interior. All the windows had iron bars on them, though no curtains or coverings. Privacy must not have been an issue for Madison, being this far from civilization. There was only the barest of furnishings, a cot, a simple folding desk and chair, a portable cooking stove, a pair of wooden cabinets and a wood stove for heat. I put down my travel bag and looked for a light source. The cabinets had lots of different equipment and supplies, including several lanterns and flashlights, so I grabbed a flashlight for my personal use. Before I could use it, a soft blue glow had begun to appear through the windows, and I looked out to see Madison lighting up one of the tree lanterns. A few minutes later, the cabin was awash in a gentle blue aura, simultaneously making the world softer and yet more surreal. Madison came in soon after, and sighed in obvious relief, securing the door with the steel latches. Ah, oh, home sweet home, she said, placing her rifle near the cot and her backpack near a cabinet. You can eat anything that hasn't spoiled, and I'll let you have the cot tonight. What about you? She shrugged. The chair or the floor. I can still rough it with the best of them. I moved to the cot and sat upon it, testing it. It was comfortable enough, but I wasn't in any rush to sleep. Hell, I wasn't sure if sleep was even possible for me. Madison went about taking off her boots and her heavier gear, going through her routine and chores as if I wasn't present. My constant anxiety abated somewhat, and thus returned my desire for answers. Do you live here all the time? I asked. Uh, just when I'm working, which is almost always, 
she replied. Every time I think the area is clear, another sighting or missing persons case comes to my attention and I'm back to it. Don't you get lonely doing this by yourself? She didn't reply immediately, choosing to grab a nutrient bar from a cabinet stockpile and munch on it for a few bites before sitting down at the table. I thought I saw a brief look of pain or regret sweep across her face before it vanished, a stoic expression back in place. She looked at me and said, I wasn't always alone. I paired up with a guy named Dr. Lycan, more of a scientist than a survivalist. Well, he wanted to understand the MLs more than kill them, though he did recognize that we couldn't just let them run around free. <sighs> Smart guy, great sense of humor, but didn't have enough respect for nature or the MLs. He was my partner for only six months. He tried setting up a series of bear traps to catch one. That's how I found out they'll chew through their own limbs to get free of captivity. And why you never get too close to a live meat locust, even a wounded one. The memory of my encounter with the three-limbed ML was quite fresh for me. I am grateful for you for saving my life, but don't you think people deserve to know what's going on out here? Wouldn't it make your life easier? Well, she shrugged and took another bite of her dinner. I honestly don't know if it would, Hector. People like to think they'll rise to the occasion when a monster comes knocking at the door, make all the right decisions, <laughs> break out of their domestic behavior, and kick ass. But there's something primal within us that triggers when confronted with a predator. It makes us want to run and hide. Not many of us have a killer's instinct. Instead, we make the quick choices, often the wrong choices. That's why my strategy with people these days is to lie to them. The creature they saw was a kid playing a prank or a starving bear killed their dead friend. I sent them on their merry way, blissfully ignorant of the unnatural threat they'd encountered. Look, I'm just a custodian, cleaning up messes, and right now we have a pretty big mess on our hands. You have my iPad in your bag, right? I did, and I retrieved it for her. On the device, she brought up the same topographical map from before, and then beckoned me to come look. She patiently pointed out how the map worked, where the landmarks were in relation to our position, and then pointed to the red X's. Those were the places where she'd seen evidence of active packs of MLs, and the connecting red lines were their movements over the last five weeks. Most years, there's never more than one active pack in this area, she explained. Well, the most I've ever had to deal with was two packs in one season. Our pack will have no more than 20 mLs before they split off to form a new one. But right now, I'm seeing evidence of five active packs. I felt my stomach tighten as she talked. I was amazed at how calm she was while talking about being surrounded by murder monsters. But we have less to deal with now, right? Well, you killed the ones coming after us. She frowned and shook her head slowly. I think that was only part of a pack. I'm pretty sure they're the ones that killed your friend, but the rest of them probably heard all the commotion and now smell the corpse dust in the air. The packs are going to come investigate. Then, maybe it's time to call in the cavalry. She sat back down at her table, laid the iPad down, and gave me an irritated glare. Oh, gee, why didn't I think of that? Cell and radio surface is terrible in this spot, so we have to go up to cell point. From here, it's several hours of hiking. Not exactly a safe thing to try with all those packs out there. Realizing that this nightmare wasn't ending any time soon, I wandered over to a nearby window and stared absently out into the blue-tinged night. Well, I wasn't sure if I was looking for approaching monsters or simply avoiding Madison's gaze. Are you sure we're safe here? I asked. Can't be sure of anything, she said. You were going to ask me if this was a government cover-up. Yep, it is. The government's afraid of these things, but there's so few of them that it's easier to play dumb than to tell the truth and panic the public. And I can't blame them for being scared. Oh, these creatures, Hector. I'm not even sure they're really alive. They don't age, they don't get sick. They don't die from hunger or thirst. They don't suffer from cold or heat. And I'm pretty sure they're fireproof because 
I've seen them run into burning homes to get at people trapped inside, and then come back out completely unscathed. They target exactly one animal. Us. Sure, nature shuts up when they're around, but those meat locusts ignore all other animals unless one attacks them. The only flesh they're after is human flesh. It's like they've evolved, or they were designed to kill us. They eat flesh not to live, but to reproduce. That pack that killed your friend, the creatures that got their pound of flesh were in the process of budding. That's what you saw in the clearing. I suspect the four we met on the road didn't get enough meat to start the budding process, and we're fixing that by going after you. Yeah, you're right, I admit it. These things are terrifying. Not terrifying enough, if you ask me. Ah, oh, the bureaucrats think they only need a few wranglers like me to control the problem. But it's hard to convince politicians to put more resources into ML control when all your evidence turned to dust and all your video is dismissed as deep fakes. Honestly, I'm not sure it's a good idea to let the secret out. How would that not be a good idea? I asked incredulously. Well, you took out a pack all by yourself. Well, the military would make short work of them. Uh, the military doesn't know how to deal with them, she calmly replied. I do, but that's after years of studying and hunting them. And there's still so much I don't understand. Even then, we were lucky to get here in one piece. Wounded MLs usually run back to their packs for safety. If I hadn't blown off that one creature's arm by accident, we'd have twelve more MLs. And if that pack had found us, with that many MLs, I doubt we would have survived. Feeling overwhelmed by all this information, my mind started to wander toward Larissa. If she'd known, if she'd been warned, she'd never have come up here. Anger mixed with horror as a mental picture of Larissa's final moments in the jaws of these monsters tried to invade my thoughts. I sat back down on my cot and concentrated on breathing to clear my mind. They need to warn the public, I finally said. We need to warn the public. I hear you, Hector, she replied with genuine sympathy. I've seen too many people, whole families in fact, get ripped apart by these things. To the government, these victims are just names you add to the missing persons record. To me, there are people we might have saved if we weren't keeping secrets. But would you want a bunch of inexperienced hunters and soldiers coming here? only to get slaughtered and create more monsters. Would you want the military to blow up the forest getting at them? Do you want the whole world, along with every amoral capitalist out here, finding out there's a very unique and dangerous creature living in the woods, something they could exploit? Yeah, secrecy can cost lives, but telling the public could cost more. I glared at her, not content with her reasoning. So is this your way of telling me to stay quiet when I get clear of here? She gave me a slight shrug. Well, as I've said before, you can walk your own path if you want. Smarter people than you have tried to expose the MLs. Right now all I care about is getting through the night. What are we doing tomorrow? I asked. Depends on what happens tonight. You should get some grub and some rest. You'll need your energy. She made herself comfortable in the corner of the cabin while I raided her food pantry, finding some stale crackers and beef jerky for my dinner. Then I settled in on the cot, thinking sleep wouldn't find me for a long time, if ever again. I don't know how long I laid staring at the cabin ceiling, a hundred horrible images and thoughts robbing me of any peace of mind. But at some point I must have fallen asleep because time skips a beat or two and the next thing I know, my mouth is covered by a warm, strong hand. My eyes shot awake, and I made out Madison's silhouette in the pale blue light. She knelt over me, her right hand over my mouth, her left hand holding a hoodie. Alarm bells went off in my mind, erasing my grogginess. Madison took her hand from my mouth, satisfied I'd gotten the message. Keep your voice low. She softly warned, handing the hoodie to me. Put this on. It's probably too small for you, but it's blue. I stood and took the hoodie, once again resisting the desire to ask what was happening. 
The hoodie was a tight fit, but I made it work. She motioned for me to follow her as she headed for one of the windows. She knelt down and pointed outside. It wasn't hard to see the problem. Faint as ghosts and ten times as scary, the small outlines of loping creatures danced on the edge of my vision. A pack of MLs had found the cabin, some running right by and disappearing into the dark beyond the lanterns, others meandering and searching about in random patterns. I watched them with macabre interest, pretending I was a wildlife photographer studying a pride of lions as they hunted at night. That helped dull the anxiety welling up within me. At times I felt like ducking away and hiding in a corner, but I only had to glance at Madison who calmly watched the gathering with calm detachment and the urge left me. As I watched, an uneasy, surreal sensation grew within me, like I was an actor in a horror movie trying to act like the practical effects in front of me were actually real monsters. These things moved around well enough, but they didn't sniff each other or fight one another, and there were no acts of dominance or submission or even play. No marking their territory or rubbing their scent on the trees. They seemed focused only on finding potential prey, like organic machines built to consume and simulate life, but lacking the nuances that would make their behavior look authentic. One of the MLs came up to the window, and I almost ducked away, but it didn't peer into the glass or even acknowledge there was glass. I don't remember any of them making contact with the cabin walls. It was almost like the cabin was invisible to them, yet they didn't collide with it as one might do when mulling about an invisible structure. It's more like they were ignoring it. I hadn't realized I'd been holding my breath the whole time, until I saw the last one fade into the night and my breathing suddenly returned. Madison stood up and grunted once, looking quite relieved as well. I counted 39, but there were probably more out there than we could see, she stated. They must have caught our sense and followed us here. But they couldn't find us, so we should be safe for a while. Did the lanterns throw them off? I asked. She nodded. It's weird how they act in the presence of blue lights. Like they can see everything, but can't quite process it the same as before. My ex-partner came up with the idea to surround the cabin with blue light lanterns. <sighs> Definitely a better idea than his let's capture one alive plan. She then gave me a knowing stare. Before you ask the next obvious question, I understand that the blue light effect is very limited. If they'd heard us in here, or if you turned on that flashlight you borrowed from my stash, oh, they'd be tearing at the cabin like sharks attending a chum bucket banquet. It only really works if there's no other stimulus for them to latch onto, and the lanterns are useless in the daytime. Is this the first time they've ever been at the cabin? I asked. No, but I'm usually prepared for them when they do. She walked over to the opposite wall of the cabin, and that's when I noticed that one of the floorboards had been pried up in that spot. Her backpack was there as well, various pieces of gear spread out on the floor. I made out a handheld radio, a satchel stuffed with a number of those glass beacons, a pistol lying next to its holster, and several ammo clips that went with her rifle. There was an electrical adapter poking out of the hole, attached to her iPad and charging it. So she wasn't as low-tech as it looked. She just preferred keeping it hidden. Either I'd been so tired that I'd slept through all of Madison's activity, or she was a pro at getting things done ninja. Well, she sat down on the floor and resumed checking and preparing her equipment. To me, it looked like she was preparing to go to war. She glanced my way as she picked up a rifle clip and inspected it, nodding at the cot with her hand. If you need any more sleep, now's the time to do it. It's an hour till sunrise, but we need to give the MLs a couple of hours to move on before we go outside. I knew there was no further chance of sleep for me, so I went over to the cabin's one chair and parked there instead. You know, when I was younger I used to enjoy donning a backpack and going on a hike around Crater Lake or Yosemite. Now all I can think of is how close I was to getting eaten by those things. You're probably safe, she replied. 
We've only seen them in half a dozen locations in the US. This is their sole habitat on the West Coast that I know of. <sighs> Forgive me if I'm not reassured. I found myself looking toward the window we'd used to view the MLs. My lizard brain was warning me not to assume the MLs were gone, despite Madison's calm demeanor. There's a lot more of those things than there should be, aren't there? She didn't answer me at first, inspecting another clip of ammo instead. She then stopped and looked at me straight on. I couldn't see her eyes in the dim light of the cabin, but I sensed there was a genuine concern in those orbs of hers. You remember the Louisville fire, right? She asked. I nodded. It was hard not to know about that fire. Louisville was, or had been, a town on the eastern part of Oregon. Roughly 10,000 people lived there. Well, last summer, the right combination of dry weather and excess deadwood generated a nasty forest fire that swept through it. Thankfully, there had been enough warning for the residents to evacuate in time. Unfortunately, not everyone had gotten the message or had been able to leave and 51 people died as a result. Now most of the residents were refugees in their own state, living wherever they could find lodging. That town was 46 miles away, as the crow flies, she said. The MLs are adapting, Hector. I don't think they caused that fire, but they may have used it to claim a few victims. The fire would have covered their kills, hid the evidence. They fed, budded, and then migrated here, their old hunting grounds, with greater numbers and a few new tactics to try out. Well, I've never had to deal with this many MLs at once, and the smart move would be to stay here for a few days and wait for them to move on. <laughs> but we're not doing that, are we? I remarked. She gave a short laugh. <laughs> well, I'm not doing that. You are free to stay here with the Landons, or come with me. You're taking your chances either way, but I'm going to sell points. I have to get the word out before this spreads further. Through all the fear and terror that had flowed through me, through all the reality-shedding experience I'd gone through in the last day, some ridiculous part of me, the same part of me that had been my motivation for coming here to help my ex-girlfriend out of a jam, absolutely refused to shut the hell up. How many people live in this area? I asked. Oh, this is a remote part of Crusoe Lake. Mostly vacation homes, but uh, around two dozen people live here at any given time, she said. You think they're still alive? Not for long. Right. And every person they eat means more MLs. She nodded. Just wait until they reach one of the campgrounds of the lake or decide to follow the road to town. Crusoe has around a thousand people. So we're going to be heroes, right? Because I can live with being a hero. She laughed lightly at my statement. <laughs> you can be a hero if you want. Just remember that heroes don't have the longest lifespan. The next two hours passed by uneventfully. The two of us sharing some hot instant coffee I managed to brew from her stockpiles while she finished her preparations. I wish I could say we learned more about each other in that time, swapping tales about her military exploits or my misadventures with Larissa, but neither of us wanted to talk much. Though she wasn't the type to admit it when she was afraid, I could tell by the way she double-checked all her gear and paced around the cabin that real fear had found her. At least now we had that much in common. She signalled that it was time by going outside and turning off the lanterns. Once I dared to come out myself, I found the world just barely visible, the sky brightening up but the sun hidden thanks to the forested hillside. I don't know if the air had acquired a chill or my nerves were sapping the warmth from my body, but I found myself hugging myself more often than not. I carried Madison's spare backpack, filled with my clothes and her food supplies, enough for a week. It was a contingency in case the path to Cell Point was impossible and we needed to find a fortified location to wait out the MLs. She also gave me the satchel with what she called flashballs, those glass beacons that put out blue light. 
If the fight was upon us, I was in charge of blinding the little monsters while Madison blew them away. We moved up the main trail from the cabin, Madison leading, her rifle at the ready. I kept a globe in my right hand as we hiked through the silent forest, the natural world hiding from the intruders in its home. I watched the environment with intense vigilance, fearing what might be hiding under the nearest bush, or wondering if that odd bulge jutting from a tree was one of them, waiting until I passed by. I felt like a thousand eyes were upon me, waiting for us to slip up even once. Well, that feeling wears you down, makes you want to find a hole to crawl into, and if I'd been alone, I surely would have. We were closer to civilization than I thought, for it was less than an hour before the trail led to another cabin, this one with a gravel road leading away from it. I felt a surge of confidence as we approached it, hoping that there was reliable communication within. That confidence shattered when Madison waved at me to slow down, and in short order, I saw why. Behind the cabin, a fire pit had been built, a small plume of smoke rising from it, and the two people enjoying the fire last night sat there, the flowery fabric of their camping chairs stained solid red, bits of their flesh scattered about. Madison spent a few minutes checking the property while I focused on an RV parked near the cabin. I found it in good condition, though. I wisely didn't open it up, and when Madison came back to me, I suggested that the vehicle might be a quicker and safer way to get to Cell Point. She poo-pooed the idea. The engine noise would draw the meat locusts, and if they managed to disable it, the best case scenario was that we'd be trapped inside. Besides... Cell point wasn't accessible by vehicle. As if to prove a point, we walked up the gravel road only a short ways before finding a Ford pickup in a ditch with a flat tire, the driver's door ajar, and a blood trail leading away from it. The trail vanished into some heavy brush. Oh, this poor soul probably intended to join the gathering at the cabin, only to share their fate instead. I looked at Madison about to suggest we make sure, but she shook her head and started walking again. I wanted to call her out on her callousness, but instead I quietly followed. I realized now that I was beginning to think like her. These kills were recent, within the last few hours, and that meant more meat locusts were soon to be born. We were rapidly running out of time, and we couldn't afford to be humanitarians at every scene of carnage we came across. The next few hours went by without further encounters, a mercy I was grateful for. Madison had a stop on the side of the road for a brief nutrient and hydration break. She seemed satisfied at our progress, confident we'd reached cell point before dark, but the lack of conversation between us denoted her disquiet. The perpetual silence of the woods, the lack of human noises and the constant vigilance required... Oh, it all felt like a twenty-pound weight strapped to my chest. I finally dared to break the silence by asking her how she got into this line of work. I kind of fell into it, she explained. I came here camping ten years ago and I happened across an old wrangler who'd gotten careless. His right leg was almost completely severed and he was crawling along the road, trying to get back to his camp. He told me it had been a bear, but his lie became pretty transparent when two MLs emerged from the woods, coming right at us. My combat instincts kicked in. I took his gun and nailed both of them. He was impressed, gave me a number to call, and, well, one thing led to another. Did he die? I asked. She nodded solemnly. I got him to a hospital, but he'd lost too much blood. Wranglers are like heroes, not the longest lifespans. Ever thought of retiring? She shook her head. <laughs> Not gonna happen. I frowned at her response. Why? Don't you think you've done your part? Deserve some normal life? <sighs> normal life? Oh, after my time in the Marines, I just couldn't adapt to normal life. I just kept thinking how arbitrary all our rules and laws are. In a normal life, you don't get to shoot your problems. You have to be civil. 
compromise, play nice and pretend it couldn't all just change in an instant. She snapped her fingers for emphasis. Climate change, environmental degradation, ah, social and cultural divides. Such big, meaty issues that you can't just shoot. So many people just want to ignore them until it's too late to change your fate. But out here, I can face down one problem. Out here, I can do something. Why would I want to retire from that? I'm not getting eaten, maybe. She laughed at that, and I found myself laughing with her. It was good to break the tension. And then we heard it. Distant, but clear as a bell in the silence of the forest. An ML hunting chorus had started up, echoing about the hillside. The tension returned and we both shot to our feet, donning our packs and moving along the road at a brisker pace than before. We had no way to know if we were on the ML's radar, but we weren't going to wait around to find out. At every turn we made and every hill we crested, I hoped that Madison would declare Cell Point was in sight. As the road eventually met up with the trail and we turned onto it, my feet began to complain. I hadn't hiked this much in years and I wasn't conditioned for it. But every so often, the hungry cries of the locusts would erupt behind us, always sounding a little closer than before, and I found the strength to push my growing pain away. We moved steadily higher, winding around several small hills. While I dared not ask if we were lost, I did wonder about the possibility. Getting lost out here would be a death sentence. But I felt a measure of relief upon passing another summer cabin, even if there was no sign of recent habitation around it. There were no signs of violence at the residence either, which I called a good omen and I'd take all the good omens I could get at this time. It was only a mile past the cabin that Madison stopped us and pointed at the top of the hill we were currently climbing, a clear spot filled with wild grasses and a few residual boulders. She looked at me and smiled. That's it, pal. Cell point. Well, hell of a hike, I remarked. Larissa must have been pretty scared to come here. I mean, she hated camping. People can surprise you, she said, for better and for worse. Another locust hunting call put us back in motion. They sounded closer than ever, and we jogged the rest of the way to the top. As tired and afraid as I was, I still had the sense to appreciate the view from Cell Point. An endless vista of green and brown encircled us, a sea of trees with lumpy hills interspersed within their verdant bounty. I could finally see Lake Crusoe to the west, a small patch of dull blue underneath the waning sun. I felt a measure of disappointment that I wouldn't get to see it up close, as I expected that, one way or another, I was never setting foot in these woods again. As if to reassure myself that we'd reached cell point, I took out my phone to test the reception. To my delight, there were bars, though, not a very strong signal. I felt the instinctual urge to call the police, but I knew better. Madison was already diving into her backpack, retrieving a satellite link-up and orienting it on the nearby boulder. She knew whom we needed, and at that point I knew the police would be woefully unprepared for what we were up against. It felt like an eternity, waiting on top of that hill, exposed and vulnerable, while Madison locked onto a constant signal and launched into a dialogue with an autonomous voice on the other end. I couldn't follow all the authentication codes she used. They sounded like cooking recipes more than military jargon. I imagine that was for foiling any eavesdroppers listening in. When she was done, she packed away her phone and looked out toward the lake, not even sparing a single glance in my direction. She'd been so matter-of-fact during the call that I hadn't gotten a good read of how the call had gone. With Madison back to her stolid stance, I had the impression that there was bad news coming. At least she spoke up before I had the chance to ask the obvious questions. Two hours, she stated, still looking far away. That's how fast they can get a helicopter to us. Rescue chopper, by the way. No military backup. Bastards can't spare a black hawk. I recoiled at the news. 
two hours. That'd be after nightfall. Not that the MLs weren't dangerous during the day, but at least we had a fighting chance in the sunlight. Maybe we should go back to the last house we passed, I suggested. Hold up there till the chopper shows. Madison shook her head, still determined not to look in my direction. If we did that and the MO show up, we'd be stuck there. Our ride would come and go and we'd probably be dead before reinforcements arrived. We have to stay here, Hector, no matter what. We're sitting ducks out here, I said. She finally turned to face me, and I could see the face she'd been hiding from me this whole time. One of resignation and disappointment. Tell me something I don't know. That pack we've been hearing all day has to have our scent by now. And after feeding, it'll be bigger and more aggressive. They'll find us before the chopper gets here. She found a small boulder to sit upon and did so, crossing her arms over her legs and staring at the ground. I'm sorry, Hector, she said, her tone full of regret. We should have stayed at my cabin. I zigged when I should have zagged. Our odds of getting out of here just got really bad. You'd think seeing Madison looking defeated would have sent me into a panic, but my panic meter had been running high for so long that I only felt exhausted. And yet with that exhaustion came an odd sense of determination, the same kind of stupid, irrational emotion that had caused me to drive out here in the first place. Seeking to help an old girlfriend when all better judgment said otherwise. I came over to Madison and almost put my hand on her shoulder, then thought better of it. She didn't seem the touching type. I'm pretty damn sure I'd be in the stomach of an ML by now if it weren't for you, I told her. So you have to be doing something right. Besides, if I die tonight, this is a decent spot for it. Under better circumstances, I'd come up here and pitch a tent for a weekend. She looked up at me and gave me a wink. You always do these corny pep talks? I smirked back at her. I think it's one of the reasons why Larissa and I broke up. She shook her head with amusement and stood up. Well, it doesn't change our odds, but we might as well prepare as best we can. As she stooped to open her backpack, I gazed out toward the horizon, hoping that the first thing I'd see moving was an approaching helicopter, and dreading that it would be a large group of approaching carnivores instead. I wish I could tell you that we prepared the grounds for an assault, like you see in stories about brave soldiers fighting against overwhelming odds, but Cell Point was incredibly barren of trees and brush and the residual boulders were barely big enough to make comfortable seats. She didn't have any explosives to plant, nor any wire or rope for making traps. We could have dug a pit or trench, but well, to what end? What counted for my combat training was Madison asking me if I'd ever handled a gun before. I admitted that I hadn't, but she still gave me her backup 9mm pistol, instructing me on its basic functions such as the iron sights and the safety and then warned me not to use it until I ran out of flashballs and I was about to be eaten, because if she was dying tonight, it was by meat locust and not by friendly fire. She also explained how the rescue was going to work. Madison had never been evacuated before, but she knew the protocol. Because we were in an ML hot zone, the chopper wasn't going to land. It would lower a rescue basket, most likely a one-seater, something that could be detached if the MLs managed to board it. She was adamant that I go up first, and, well, I didn't have a problem with that. The rest of our time was spent watching the countryside around us, listening to the distant howls of the meat locusts as they searched for their next meal. Sometimes they cried out in rapid succession, several times a minute. Other times the pause would be ten minutes or more. I tried to judge the distance of the pack by the volume of their cries, feeling bursts of relief when it sounded like they were further away and spikes of terror when they sounded closer. We reached the beginning of twilight without incident, and I started daring to think we might survive this. There were twenty minutes left before the rendezvous time, and the MLs remained absent. Yet every minute that ticked by felt like another pound of weight added to my nerves. 
the light gradually slinking away, and with it our odds of survival, if the ML showed. Madison turned on a flashlight mounted to her rifle, and I had the one grabbed from her cabin, but our meager lights were no substitute. We sat back to back on the same boulder, Madison's rifle on her lap, me with a flash ball in hand. It had been some time since we'd heard from the MLs, and I didn't know if that was a good thing. I found my thoughts were on what I'd do when it got clear, and I didn't see any clear path for me. Try to go back to my job as if everything was normal? Go to the media and tell my story? Would I even have a choice in my future if the government wanted to keep things quiet? So, uh, what do you think they are? Asked Madison, right out of the blue. I was shocked enough by Madison's abrupt breaking of the silence that I wasn't sure who they were at first. The MLs? I replied. She nodded. Well, they don't strike me as natural. I think they're somebody's experimental bioweapon. Well, I had that thought too at first, she said. But uh, I don't think we're advanced enough to create life forms like these things. What do you think now? She groaned at my query. You'll think I'm nuts. I laughed at her statement. <laughs> I doubt that. Come on, tell me your wacky idea. She shrugged and said, I'm not religious, but I wonder if there is some ethereal force out there, something that keeps the balance, not for the sake of humanity, but for life itself. Whenever that balance gets too distorted, it does something to even it out again. It doesn't exterminate or destroy the problem, it just, well, levels the playing field. So, um, there's some kind of divine equalizer, I asked. They're here to put us in our place. I paused as I mulled the idea around in my head. Well, I suppose that makes about as much sense as... I didn't get a chance to finish. The MLs finally broke the peace by crying out once more. Madison looked about nervously swiveling her head in different directions, and at first I wondered why this particular outcry bothered her more than the others. But when the howls erupted again, I realized they were much closer than before, and coming from different directions. Terror seized me as Madison moved off of our boulder and began using it as a perch to steady her aim. She had the northern slope covered, which up until now was the opposite direction from which I thought the MLs would arrive. Did they split up? I asked. Either that, or we have multiple packs converging on us, she replied, her eyes fixed ahead. Get ready with the flashbulbs. I'll tell you when to throw. The weight had been nerve-wracking before, but now it was nigh intolerable. I stood there, waiting for movement, praying for the rumble of a chopper's blades, and cursing myself for wanting to play hero. I gripped the flashball tightly, hoping it would give me courage. It gave me nothing. Then the pack arrived, and at first I was more confused than terrified, because I saw only blurry figures loping through the darkness, the first of them cresting the hill and racing in our direction. I'd forgotten about the ML's camouflage ability. My god... How was Madison supposed to hit those indiscernible shapes in the dark if I could barely make them out myself? Fear robbed me of my wits for a long moment, and it took Madison's harsh voice to knock me back to reality. Throw it, she ordered. I pushed the ball's button and threw the ball at the approaching pack, well ahead of them. There was a five-second delay, and those had to have been the longest five seconds of my life. A brilliant blue flare flashed out of the darkness, momentarily blinding me. Madison had warned me to look away after throwing one, and now I knew why. Thankfully, my vision cleared quickly as the blue burst wasn't as intense as a regular flash bomb, but then my ears were buffeted by the loud reports of Madison's rifle. It was an assault on my senses, and I coped by covering my ears with my hands and forcing myself to look past the blobby afterimages. My reward was to see the ML's charge come to a halt, the creatures fully revealed as they rubbed their eyes and meandered about in confusion, their horrid voices crying out in rage, or, dare I say, 
even panic. One after another, an ML dropped to the ground or flew backward as Madison's aim held true. I tried to guess the size of the pack and came up with around three dozen, but by the time the pack had recovered enough to flee back the way they came, it was much smaller. I almost whooped in joy at seeing the bastards run, but then three raucous choruses of howls erupted out of the darkness surrounding us. Get another ball ready, ordered Madison. As she reloaded her rifle and shifted her stance to the western approach, I did so hurriedly. The flashball I'd thrown was now pulsing every few seconds, nowhere near as intensely as before, but enough to keep the MLs from coming from the north for now. The second wave did indeed come from the western slope, and I felt a surge of confidence as I let fly the second ball, this time looking away before it went off. I closed my eyes for extra protection, and after a few seconds Madison went to work, thinning the incoming horde. When I opened my eyes again, I realized that I was looking south, and to my sudden terror, saw another pack approaching. The lead members caught up in the flashball's effect, while the rear ones came onward. With growing dread, I glanced backward, towards the east, and saw a third pack advancing. Madison was right. These things did learn. She was too busy killing them to see the others coming at us, or to hear me above her rifle. I grabbed two more flashballs, armed them, and sent one sailing at the eastern pack, the other at the southern one. They went off almost simultaneously and I swore as my eyes recoiled from the combined bursts of hostile luminescence. Madison swore much more vividly as the unexpected pulse hit her, and she gave me the kind of look you give a dumbass who may have just gotten you killed. What the hell? she demanded. I only had to point in the general directions of the other packs for her to realize the shitstorm we were in. For now, their momentum was broken, the creatures blindly rushing around, running into each other, tripping and lashing out at anything they came into contact with. Madison swiveled and changed tactics, picking off the closest MLs to us. I pulled out the pistol I'd tucked into my belt and kept it at the ready. I still had half a dozen flashballs at my disposal, but right now they couldn't do any further good, and there were dozens of half-blind and fully enraged MLs on the hillside with us. Then, I heard it. Above Madison's gunshots, above the screams of dozens of murderous creatures, and above the pounding of my blood vessels reverberating in my ears, I heard it. I knew the familiar whomp whomp of an incoming helicopter, and as I scanned the sky, I saw the lights approaching from the west, distant at first, but growing steadily larger. It had to be our rescue chopper, and it was mercifully early. With four flashballs going off on the ground around us, they'd have no trouble zeroing in on us. Madison, the chopper, I yelled. She finished blasting one more ML and then scanned the sky as I had. She let out a whoop and added, Oh, the cavalry coming. Madison had picked off the closest MLs, but the rest weren't retreating. In fact, they only grew more frantic and determined as the chopper closed in, racing around the hill like witless piranha desperately searching for their dinner. The flashballs flared at irregular intervals, keeping the creatures off balance, but also increasing their ferocity. I watched as two MLs collided and ripped into each other with their lethal claws, pale flesh and clouds of dust flying in all directions. Madison held her fire for now, grabbing a flare from her vest pocket and handing it to me. Light it and start waving, she ordered. I did so, a red glow now accompanying the blue flashes lighting up the night. I looked to the chopper and began waving the flare in its direction. Soon enough, a white spotlight found me, and I became half blind and half deaf as the wind buffeted me and engine vibrations assailed my ears. All this madness around me, and all I could do was wave the flare and hope for the best. Which was why I barely heard the warning from Madison, and I picked up on it too late. The ML came at me from the side, screeching as it charged. It must have noticed the flare, and I was too disoriented to react quickly. 
probably never reach me. Madison charged ahead, swinging her rifle, connecting with the ML's face and knocking it aside. Dazed, the creature turned its fury on her instead, and Madison used that brief moment to aim her gun, pull the trigger, and nothing. She was dry on ammo. Not even missing a beat, she reversed her grip on the rifle and swung it like a club at the ML, right as the creature swept a wicked claw at her midsection. I heard the sickening results of their blows, Madison caving the creature's face in, the ML slashing through her vest. They both collapsed, Madison falling on her side, her hands on her midsection, trying to stem the wetness that had already spread over her torso. I threw down the flare and went to help her, trying to get a look at her wound. Even injured, she managed to push me back, yelling at me to keep waving the flare and then get ready to catch the basket when it came. She also demanded her pistol, but before I could give it up, a wave of pain hit her, and it was all she could do to just lie there and not scream in agony. Luckily for us, we didn't need to wait long. Into the spotlight came down the empty rescue basket on a silver wire, the helicopter hovering right overhead. I put down the pistol next to Madison and grabbed the basket, pulling it over her supine form. I went to her and helped her to stand up. I still couldn't make out the depth of her wound, but she grunted with every step she took, and she could barely even stand at all. But instead of getting into the basket, she sat down next to it. I could see the sheen of sweat on her face now, the agony shining in her eyes. She shook her head at me, and I could tell where this was going. You're still going first, Hector, she said, her words strained. Get in. I shook my head. You're the injured one. She managed a weak laugh. You won't last down here, Hector. Don't waste your life on someone like... Her words trailed off and she started slouching forward. I caught her before her head hit the ground and tried to rouse her, but she was barely conscious now. She had to be suffering from blood loss or shock. In that instant, I admit the thought of leaving her behind had crossed my mind. It was the smartest move in the end and honestly I wanted to live. I wanted to go back to my apartment, put all this horror behind me, and try to justify my survival any way I could. I just needed to get in the basket and I'd be safe. But instead, I put my hands under Madison's armpits and with a combination of shoving and pulling, I got her secured inside. I went frantically to the helicopter and the basket ascended into the dark sky. Madison quietly left me behind and I was alone on the ground, comforting myself with my one act of true heroism to distract me from how screwed I now was. The meat locusts learned. That truth was irrefutable. One of them was showing off that truth by picking up one of the glass flashballs and bashing it against a rock. The reinforced glass gave after several blows, the mechanism within a few more. I don't know if the creature had deliberately sought the ball or had found it by accident, but there was now a hole in my defences. I grabbed another flashball from my satchel and prepared to throw it when I looked around and saw another ML smashing at a second flashball with a rock at its hands. I held my throw. They understood now what was making all that terrible blue light. I expected the basket to come back down in a few minutes, and I didn't have a few minutes. Madison must have rubbed off on me during our brief time together, because I found myself reacting not with terror, but with cold calculation. My mind whirled as I grabbed Madison's pistol, plotted the direction back to the last cabin we'd passed on our way here, and ran for it, hoping to God I was right. Gripping the gun in my left hand, I tossed the flashball ahead of me, the orb emitting a new blue pulse as I sprinted past it. I left the hilltop, the helicopter, Madison, and all that chaos behind me. I ran past screaming monsters, all of whom wanted a literal piece of me. I ran for my life. (laughs) 
Luck is a fickle mistress, even at the best of times. Luck got me into this insanity in the first place, but Luck also saw fit to grant me a reprieve of sorts. You see, my navigational skills proved to be spot on. The cabin loomed ahead of me, a symbol of hope for a desperate soul on the run. I had five more balls on me when I started my last ditch escape. I was forced to use four of them because each one would only last a minute at best before one of the pursuing MLs smashed it. And then they were hot on my heels again. The cabin door had been locked, which I'd expected to be the case, so I ended up using the pistol not for self-defense, but as a cudgel to break a window. That was the worst part of it, smashing through the glass and squeezing through the narrow opening while under the short-lived protection of a flashball. I wound up in a bedroom with a door I could bar on the outside, and that door gave me a few more precious minutes before the MLs figured out there were other windows into the cabin and began smashing their way inside. What saved me, if you can call it being saved, was that the cabin had a cellar. Not just any cellar, but a cellar stocked with provisions and camping gear. The owner had apparently planned for a lengthy stay, just in case civilization fell apart while he was on vacation. I was able to get inside before the MLs breached, and thankfully the cellar door had a lock on the inside. It's a sturdy door, but I don't have the means to brace it any further. I have one more flashball and a pistol that I barely know how to use. If the door falls, I'm dinner. I've listened to them scraping and clawing, ramming and smashing at the door. The first night was the worst the racket continuing into the early hours of the morning. They're still trying from time to time. Perhaps when either new ones show up or they can't find anyone else to eat and they come back to have another go at me. It's been five days since I came down here and they're still trying. Food-wise, there are lots of pickled and preserved stuff and a good supply of water. I've taken an inventory and I think I could last for two months down here if need be. There's a porta potty but nowhere to put the excrement in the long term. It's going to get messy at some point. The bad news is that I lost my phone during my flight from Cell Point, And there's no phone line down here. I can't call out and no one knows I'm here. Oh, except for the meat locusts, naturally. There is an emergency radio at my disposal. Useful for getting local radio stations but not much else. I use it to keep tabs on the world, hoping to hear news about little monsters and dead people and some sign I'm going to be rescued. Well, something's happening, but it's nothing good. Last night, reports started coming in on a series of animal attacks in and around Crusoe. Fatalities are piling up, a curfew is in effect, and eyewitnesses are talking about strange creatures running about. I have a pretty good idea what's going on, and I suspect it's only going to get worse. I think about Larissa a lot, and when I don't think about her, I think about Madison. For all my desire to come to the rescue, I don't know if I've done any good. Certainly not for Larissa, or the people of Crusoe. Oh, I can only hope Madison is alive. She's the only one I trust to come save the day. I certainly can't trust the government. They knew there was a problem here, but all they did was slap a band-aid on it, relying on the good efforts of a few honorable individuals to contain the threat. Then bleeding them dry and throwing them away like trash. But now the problem is out there, and people are dying. So here I wait, wondering if anyone will come looking for me wondering what kind of life I'd be returning to if I did get rescued, and wondering how much more punishment that door can take before the meat locusts finally get to me. Well, I have to tell you, as a storyteller, you live for days like these. What a beautifully written story, and it was an absolute joy for me to execute the delivery as best as I can for all of you. Oh. 
Beautifully paced, fully explained. No loose strings, no smoking guns left. Smoking, for want of a better phrase. Uh, just fantastic storytelling, building the tension throughout. Not one useless sentence among the whole thing, and bringing you to a fantastic conclusion that, that is hopefully as satisfying for you as a listener as it was for me to read it. Damn right. Love it. Absolutely love it. Well, my long-term plan is to be delivering stories like this on the channel uh, once this virus thing is uh, out of the way and uh, the kids are out of the house, of course. Do the longer ones here and 20 to 30 minute ones over on the second channel. Sound good to you? Hope so. Well, it's Friday again. These quarantine weeks are flying by, aren't they? That's definitely enough for me for one night. But I promise you, my dear friends, I'll be back again very, very soon. Till then, sweet dreams and bye-bye.